Hey, what's up everyone? Today we're going to talk about some fairly uncontroversial stuff, like wokeness and Karl Marx. It's been fashionable for a while now to compare wokeness to a religion or to a cult, in that it has orthodoxy, heretics, original sin, and all that. But this never struck me as a critique that hits the target dead on, in that it doesn't paint that clear of a picture of what makes wokeness distinct. And the critique that does do it for me, which you've probably guessed, is the critique that wokeness fundamentally comes from the ideas of Karl Marx. I'm far from the first person to make that argument, and I think most people that talk about this stuff generally struggle to not sound like conspiracy theorists, and those are usually the grounds that are used to wave away this kind of criticism. But there's actually a lot of substance behind it, and if you follow the academic trail, all roads really do point to Karl Marx. So I'm going to go through it more slowly and thoroughly than I normally do, because I think this is all criminally misunderstood and needs to be understood if we're ever going to disentangle ourselves from this thing. So, yeah. Stop it there and welcome to Speak Freely Here. We celebrate the freedom of speech. And today we're gonna to be reacting to an interesting video where he talks about what he believes the root of wokeism is and how it comes from Karl Marx or Marxism. And he's right, I've heard plenty of intellectuals speak on wokeness as a religion or a cult. And there's many reasons why he just went through a few of them. I'm not gonna really run through it because this video is already long enough. I'll let him explain. And I feel like the reason why it's hard not to come off like a conspiracy theorist is because shit is strange these days. Like reality is becoming stranger than fiction. So when talking about reality, it's not hard for it to sound like a fairy tale or a dystopian fictional nightmare, but it's true. It's, it's, or it's coming true, it's becoming the reality. But anyway, I wanna get right back into the video. But before you do, if you like type of videos, please like, comment, subscribe, hit the button, get the notifications when I do upload. All of that really does help with the algorithm, guys. And if you'd like to support the channel further, you can donate. My PayPal me link is in the description box below and sometimes in the comment section. Of course it helps, but you don't have to. You can just like, comment, and subscribe. Another great way to support this channel is visit my brand new merch shop. Links down below and links to all of the eternal platforms I'm on, my socials, including my Twitter. All the ways to support me and all the ways to contact me for business is always in the links down below. Other than that, sit back, relax, and continue to enjoy the video. All right, here we go. Yeah. So I'm going to start with going over Marxism. Not because I think you haven't heard explanations of Marxism before, but because I think explanations of it usually miss a crucial point. And that point's also crucial to understanding wokeness. And that crucial point is that Marxism is an ideology made fundamentally in opposition to liberalism. If that surprised you, then I'm glad you're watching this. Marxism at its core is a critique of liberalism and presents itself as the alternative to liberalism. And by liberalism, I don't mean Democrats in America right now. I mean what we now think of as the founding principles of Western civilization. I'm sorry to say we're gonna have to go over liberalism too because it's crucial to understanding everything else I'm gonna say. So to give a quick refresher on that, liberalism is the ideology that essentially champions the freedom of the individual, if at all humanly possible. So liberals wanna maximize your personal rights while putting as few restrictions on it as possible. And the place where they mostly draw the line is if you put someone else in physical harm. So you don't have the right to punch someone in the face and you don't have the right to shout fire in a crowded theater because people could panic and get hurt. But besides that, they wanna maximize your individual freedoms. And that includes the freedom to think for yourself, um, speak for yourself, protest, um, have a fair trial, uh, own property and a bunch of other stuff. I agree with him that it is classical liberalism, right? That is what a classical liberal used to be, and that's how I, that's what I grew up with. When the idea of liberal is freedom for the individual, freedom of freedom of freedom of speech, freedom from censorship, basically to be left alone, to be your own person, to live your life the way you want to live it without it being trampled upon. Um, I don't feel like that's what liberalism at all is anymore, or I don't think that's the idea that liberals that call themselves liberals today is going by. That's why you more or less call them progressives, um, leftists or lefties, something like that. And I do agree with him that a lot of people kind of, as a throwaway, will say these communist Marxist liberals, right? Because we feel like they're behaving more like a Marxist 
or a socialist or a communist than a classical liberal that we all grew up knowing, the definition that he just described. I also want to say really quick that I'm giving him all, all of the uh, recognition from him doing all the research and talking about this very precisely and clearly. He talks about stuff like this a lot on his channel. He talks about, you know, communism, fascism, what capitalism is. He he breaks it down in a way that's very more understandable instead of, again, just throwaway tropes that a lot of people use, including myself. So I'm not trying to take away from his work by reacting to his channel. I'm learning just as much as you're learning and we're learning together. And that's why I think these uh, videos are really interesting. And plus, including my own commentary and my own ideas upon whatever subject that we are talking about or reacting to. But anyway, let's continue. So a quintessential liberal text is this one, the Bill of Rights. Liberalism was made as an attempt to form an ideology that represents the interests of everyone within a society. They thought that as long as everyone had a certain amount of rights that were protected and a freedom to voice their concerns, society would over time naturally become better and better. And they knew full well this would lead to all kinds of struggles and failures and dangers and all that. They said, overall, this is the best system. And over time, society will become more peaceful and more progressive. I think what he means by it's going to be messy because freedom is messy. Freedom isn't efficient and quick and clear and clean. Freedom is messy, especially when you have a large population of individuals. What China has is more efficiency because they just trample over people's freedoms to get things done. And what America has is more freedoms thus far. And so things are less efficient, right? And some people don't like that. Um, we saw that a lot in the last two years of the global coup, where people were even questioning the love of freedom from Americans. Like, Oh, is too much freedom too much? You know, things aren't efficient. People aren't just locking down. People aren't following the mandates. People aren't wearing the masks. People aren't getting the pokes, right? If we just take those freedoms away, then things can go quicker the way we want them to go or to resume, right? And so that is the that is the pros and cons of having freedom. I would rather things be a mess and have more freedoms rather than things be efficient and have less freedom. But anyway, let's continue. I think the main problem people have with liberalism is this idea that it's too passive of a take on progressiveness and that it doesn't actively try to encourage its citizens to improve the conditions of the least well off. And instead it instills this everyone for themselves kind of attitude. And within that, some people become wildly successful while others struggle and kind of fall through the cracks. So you could say that liberalism is great for laying down a base layer of human rights but it also tends to create large power imbalances within society and doesn't actively encourage its citizens to do much about it, at least in any kind of expedient way. I mean, he says encourage, I would more say coerce in a toxic manner, like uh, cancel culture, like being yelled down at, like being labeled and smeared the most undesirable thing society has decided is undesirable, like labeling you a racist or a phobe of something, like, you know, marching to your personal home and demanding you change your mind. He says encourage, I say coerce, force, fear monger, scare, threaten people to move in a certain direction. Anyway, let's continue. So because of that, there's room for other ideologies that address that, and that's where Marxism comes in. Marxists basically say that liberalism is a protection mechanism for oppressive behavior. And the alternative that they put forward goes something like them saying, freedom ends where oppression begins. How do they know where oppression begins? Because they're pretty much obsessed with it. Marxists are basically bloodhounds for oppression. The freedom that Karl Marx was concerned with was the freedom to own private property. And the oppression that Karl Marx was concerned with was class oppression. Um, yeah, they're like bloodhounds for oppression because they are being taught a lot in universities and I don't know, sometimes through all these online uh, social media apps to veer society, to, to view the world through the lens of the oppressed and the oppressors, to view the world through the lens of 
the pow like powerful or the powerful do the powerless. And so it's like they're very black and white in that and they don't necessarily see the nuances of a lot of things. Like the example of the little black girl who failed math in school, instead of seeing the nuance of, around that of maybe she has a poor home life, maybe she's not getting enough sleep, maybe there's something going on in her life personally that's distracting her, or maybe she's just not very good at math. They just go like, well, she's doing poor so she must be being oppressed by something so let's just focus on her oppressor instead of looking at the nuance of the situation but anyway let's continue so i should talk about oppression for a minute because the way that marxists frame oppression is very distinct we normally think of oppression as something that arises or doesn't circumstantially and something that everyone should theoretically be capable of so in one moment you could hypothetically be an oppressor or not and in another moment i could be an oppressor or maybe even oppressed and that should scale up too like the catholic church in one moment you could say that they're an oppressor and in another moment you could say that they're not or maybe they're even oppressed so we normally think of it as something that no one is inherently guilty of and also no one is inherently exempt from and it's really dictated by a circumstance marxism on the other hand and this should already be sounding eerily familiar, has this particular way of dividing society up into two parts, the oppressed and the oppressors. And you're either in one group or the other. And what determines which group you fall into is based on your identity. And in Marx's case, it was based in class identity. And he thought that the dynamics of this oppression were baked into the nature of society itself. So the only way to overcome this oppression is to change society itself. In other words, have a revolution and make a new society free from oppression. Yes, looking at the uh, looking at oppressor uh, through marginalized groups. That's why a lot of uh, university students have a different definition of racism. To them, black people can't be racist because black people don't yield power. They're not at the top of the hierarchy. So no matter how much a black person hates a white person, because I guess white people, the one percent of the one percent, represents every single white individual in the world. That means you, I can't be racist to you because that person, that hierarchy, that, that representation of your whiteness, they have power and there's not a black person that has the most power. So I, I don't, yeah, it's very confusing, but that's, that's basically why they see it that way because black people have no power or we don't yield as much power. So we can't be racist. You can only be racist white person because we see you as the oppressor that you yield more power, even if it's not on an individual level, but because a lot of Marxists just group people together, that they, they, they rip, they strip people of the individuality, which in turn strip people of their humanity and they just see people as one big group. So you white person, you use power, you're the oppressor, therefore I can never be racist towards you because I have less power than you, I am the oppressed. And that's kind of how they see a lot of these groups just like that. Anyway, let's continue. So then you might ask, how do you know what kind of fundamental change society needs in order to get rid of this oppression? And they would say, you need to figure out what was being allowed to occur in order for this oppression to take place. And in Marx's case, the freedom, again, that he was concerned with was the freedom to own private property. So the people who are exercising this freedom to own private property, and this includes the means of production, are necessarily the oppressors. And the people who are not exercising that freedom, so they don't own private property, are necessarily the oppressed. And as long as the freedom to own private property exists, oppression will inherently be baked into society. I've heard this before, but I still don't understand that. So the people that create businesses and create jobs so the economy can flow are now the oppressors. But if they didn't exist, there would be no jobs, there would be no companies, there would be no one to hire people to have a, an economy, to have a job market, a work market, right? But you do see this, again, amongst the youth who practice these ideas, where they believe that the person who owns the business should dismantle the, the, the ownership of that business and disperse it to the workers instead, even though they're the one who created the business. The private property thing, I just don't understand how you make it up in your head that that means you're an oppressor. Someone worked really hard, someone saved money, and they bought a house. 
I don't, like, how does that make you an oppressor? Like, I've heard people say, like, well, you shouldn't be able to own land because the land is really originally owned by the natives. So you're inherently a colonizer if you have a house or you own property. But again, if you try to disperse it to the natives, which natives? Because natives also went to war for pro um, land ownership and property. But anyway, let's continue. <laughs> Marx thought that in order for this revolution to happen, people first need to awaken and see the nature of the oppression happening around them. And if they didn't, if they were blind to that oppression, in his terminology, they would then have false consciousness. If they awakened and they were able to see the true nature of this class oppression happening around them, in his terminology, they would gain class consciousness. Marx thought that a critical number of people needed to awaken to class consciousness. And if they did that, they would be naturally motivated to band together in a collective of like-minded class conscious people, rise up and overthrow their oppressors and make a new utopian society. And by the way, the economic implementation of Marxism, where the freedom to own private property, especially if it relates to the means of production, is abolished, is communism. And the economic implementation of liberalism, where you have the right to own private property, and you have the freedom to exchange goods and services with others is capitalism. So yeah, Marxism 101. Marxism is an inherently unstable ideology that tends to initially sound good, but then gets out of control. So if a Marxist says freedom ends where oppression begins, you might say, hey, I mean, that doesn't sound bad. We don't wanna be born into a world where people oppress us for things we can't control. But then you say, wait, where is this oppression? And they say, everywhere. And then you say, well, who gets to say what is and isn't oppression? And they say, we do. And you say, can we talk about it? And they say, no. Which honestly just builds a hierarchy. Like if you're putting yourself up there to say, we make the law, we define what oppression is, no one can disagree with us, don't you then turn into the oppressor? Because you're creating a hierarchy. Like makes no sense. But anyway, let's continue. If you disagree with them, Marxist organizations tend to categorize you as part of the problem. And when Marxist organizations come into power, they tend to shortly after declare speech and action against the movement as oppression, and they abolish political opposition, and oppressive. things tend to quickly go further downhill from there. But that in itself is oppressive and fascist to say we are going to basically demonize or jail or criticize or get rid of anyone who criticizes our belief system and our way of life, censoring, getting rid of freedom of speech. That in itself is oppressive. I thought Marxism was born in uh, an attempt to try to get rid of oppression. But in, in doing that, they become the oppressor. But anyway, let's continue. Downhill from there. As you probably know, every attempt to implement Marxism so far upon a whole country has been a disaster for human rights, bringing tyranny, death, censorship, and charges, and never bringing the free utopian society that was promised, and we think was responsible for the deaths of something like 100 million people in the 20th century. And, and the people who suffer the worst are always working class people, the people who Marxism was promising to represent. Who gets yelled at the most? Who gets criticized the most when it comes to a lot of this woke ideology? It's the working class. It's the middle American, mom and dad, suburban families. They're the ones who are criticized the most because they don't understand all this woke shit, all this woke language. They're the ones who get scoffed at the, at the most from the bourgeoisie, from the academics of the world, or the working class. A lot of the progressive will say that they're for the working class, but they don't even give a fuck about what the working class wants because they they think I know better, I'm educated, I went to Harvard, I know more than you. And so they try to implement rules that they think will be helpful to the working class but it's just hurtful to the working class. It's the same thing with like uh, global warming, shutting down a lot of these plants, these oil plants, these these coal plants, literally destroying entire towns, economy, turning into complete ghost towns, destroying these people's jobs because they didn't implement any backup plan for these workers once they destroyed their economy, right? And so it's like they don't care about the working class at all because when the working class, again, middle America say, hello, we're here, they get told to shut the fuck up. It's the same thing with gun rights. A lot of these people who live in very rural areas who need their guns, but anyway, let's continue. But that being said, Karl Marx was a pretty smart guy. And a lot of the critiques he made of liberalism and capitalism were pretty sharp. 
And if you read some of them today, you might even agree with them, even if he's obviously not capturing the full picture. I think because of that, there have, since Marx's death, always been people who were inspired by him and didn't think that the disasters of trying to implement Marxism were enough of a deterrent and decided to try to adapt Marx to their own political environment. So the practice of doing that, of taking Marx and adapting him, not taking him literally word for word, is called neo-Marxism. But neo-Marxists don't call themselves neo-Marxists. Yeah, they tend to just call themselves plain Marxists. An, so I'm going to use that word too because it's shorter and there's about zero people trying to adapt Marx literally in the 21st century. And I don't know how to talk about neo-Marxists without feeling like I'm doing this. So I think wokeness is the result of a series of adaptations of Marx. And I think that there's a clear intellectual path we can follow to get us there. And I'm actually not aware of any alternatives. So if you have one, let me know because I'm genuinely curious. But in the meantime, I'm going to lay out the path of adaptations as I understand it. I'm going to break it down into three major steps. The first was to expand Marx's ideas, which were at the time almost entirely about class, into the realm of culture. The first major influence for this came from this Italian man in the early 1900s, who argued that elites control culture, and that control they have over culture gives them a kind of dominating influence over the public and makes the public kind of complacent with whatever the agenda elites have for them. So in liberal capitalist society, the elites within that society can use culture to essentially brainwash the public into not questioning that society. And that's why these revolutions that Marx predicted haven't been happening. So to fix that, Marxists need to get influence in culture. And once they gain that cultural influence, they can use it to educate the public. And once that happens, then the public will rise up and revolution will happen. Whoever controls the media, controls the culture, controls the perspective, controls the people. All right, let's continue. <laughs> so the incorporation of Marxism into culture is called cultural Marxism. And no, that's not a right-wing uh, anti-Semitic buzzword. That's an actual academic word that people have been using for a long time. And if you don't believe me, go into Google Scholar and type in cultural Marxism. Cultural Marxism was then expanded upon starting in the 20s and 30s by the work of a think tank called the Frankfurt School, which was a bunch of guys that basically set out to criticize and readapt Marx after they saw that Marxism had failed to overtake capitalism in Western civilization. And they expanded upon these ideas of cultural Marxism, saying that the elites who control culture in all these different ways are the oppressors, and regular people who are subject to the impositions of this culture are the oppressed. And the culture they're critiquing is the liberal culture. So they're saying that liberal culture is basically forcing people into these boxes of how it wants them to behave and how to think. So it's controlling their thoughts, it's controlling their behavior, and they say this all has a dehumanizing effect that makes them not be able to think outside the system and to be less alive. I think the main contribution of the Frankfurt School was to take these types of critiques and place them in a modern, um, updated American framework, because they're mostly working out of New York at the time and mostly critiquing American culture. So that gave people on the left in America access to these kinds of critiques. And on top of that, they wove in these radicalizing arguments for the left, like this book, which tried to redefine authoritarianism as something that not anyone could be capable of, but something that only the right is capable of. This was another hugely influential piece which argued that tolerance in the traditional sense of being tolerant of people you disagree with actually serves to protect oppression happening in society. And as an alternative, he proposes liberating tolerance. What? And what is that? It's to be intolerant of people on the right and extra tolerant of people on the left. So he's advocating against free speech for people on the right. And he's saying to enforce this, people can go outside the law if they need to and even use violence if they need to, since he questions the effectiveness of nonviolence, speculating that Gandhi's success with it may have been a fluke. So this was basically the early intellectual version of the Antifa handbook, and also just a broad intellectual justification for the censorship of the right by people on the left while labeling it progressive. What? Oh my God, that all makes sense. That makes total sense if this pseudo sort of 
neo-Marxism is being taught and fed to schools, uh, universities, online, whatever, that makes sense why we see the fact that progressivism has been being able to run wild with radical, extreme, dangerous, destructive ideas. And a Republican can say, boo, and they get criticized as the worst thing on the fucking planet because they're literally being taught to sit to the right, let the left go crazy, only only people that can be totalitarian is the right and not the left. What the fuck? Like, that makes total sense. Oh my God. And I agree with him, the whole, like, whoever controls the culture, whoever controls the media, I agree with that. That you can kind of control society to where the way it flows, people's perception of things, people's belief system and values and all those things, morals, right? I agree with that. And you're saying that the people who control this are the oppressors, but then you want to take control of that so you can then control and construct society the way you want to, it to be. So people aren't thinking for themselves and they only think about the world the way you want them to think about the world. Then you become the oppressor. You're literally trying to demolish the oppressor so you can become the oppressor. But because you don't see yourself as an oppressor, oppressor because only the right can be oppressors and only the right can be totalitarian because you're on the left, then you you can't be. No matter, even if you're doing the exact same thing you're criticizing because your ideas are different, that's what make it non-totalitarian. That is insane to me. That makes absolute sense. Oh my God. Anyway, let's continue. The right by people on the left while labeling it progressive. I know it's hard to imagine that these types of academic works can really have that much of an influence on reality. But you have to realize this guy was very popular at the time, especially on this college campuses. He had a kind of superstar intellectual kind of status, similar to how we think of like Zizek or Peterson or maybe Bell Hooks today. So this wasn't like some kind of obscure work that nobody read. But anyway, I'm just going to do one more because I'm trying not to make this section boring and I'm not totally confident that I'm succeeding at it. This I'm, paper I'm, I'm brought together involved. the ideas of the Frankfurt School under the name critical theory. Critical theory compares itself to traditional theory, which is when people try to be objective in their examination of and interpretation of the world. Critical theorists, on the other hand, have their political goals in mind as they work through academia. So they don't say what they think is objectively true. They say, if they're a critical theorist, what they need to say in order to reach their political goals. So, so this is planting the seeds for the death of objectivity in leftist academia and giving intellectual justification for people to work in academia as political agents. So what are the goals they said academics should be aiming for? To adapt Marx and transform us into the right kind of society. What kind of society is that? A society where there is no exploitation or oppression. A society where injustice is abolished. So basically they're trying to teach people to go undercover as academics to try to push Marxism using certain language so it's not too obvious or even lying and then justifying it basically like the ends justifying the means kind of thing. Makes a lot of sense. The second major stage started in the 60s when this cultural Marxist framework was adapted by identity politics movements. At the time, there was a huge resurgence of interest in Marx, especially among young people. And the activism that came out of that is broadly referred to as the New Left. And the leader of the New Left is mostly thought to be Marcuse, who wrote Repressive Tolerance, who I was just talking about. So he was working at the same time that this stage was starting. So the timelines are a little bit blurred together. Anyway, this is the time period where critical race theory was developed which took critical theory and integrated it into a racial framework. Critical race theory presumes that unfavorable differences in group outcomes come from racial oppression. And as a solution wants to end racial oppression among a broader goal of wanting to end all forms of oppression, which also puts us in a world where the first amendment is attacked on the grounds of being a protection mechanism for racial oppression. Around the same time, second wave feminism showed up as an alternative to the more liberal first wave that came before it. And the basic Marxist contribution to that was to take Marx's idea of the proletariat breaking free of their chains and seizing the means of production from the bourgeoisie, taking that and replacing it with women, breaking free of the shackles that men have put on them, and empowering each other to rise up and smash, smash the, patriarchy. the patriarchy. The gay liberation front happened around the same time. 
And I think for a lot of people, it was just an opportunity to get respect and visibility for people who weren't straight. But if you look at the literature, like the manifestos that came out of it, it did have an explicitly Marxist wing to it, which called out various forms of systemic oppression, like straight supremacy, and called for various forms of solidarity and collective action, and for ending um, freedom that allowed these oppressive behaviors to occur, which would bring on a new freedom. free society. I'm sorry, like that's such an oxymoron. Let's end freedom so we can be more free. What? Huh? I get what you're saying, but still it's a fucking oxymoron and it will never work. Let's continue. At this point, Marx has been adapted so many times that he's pretty watered down, but the basic dynamic is still there. In Marx's writing, the power dynamics in liberal capitalist society necessarily means the bourgeoisie are the oppressors and the proletariat are the oppressed. In critical race theory, the power dynamics in white Western society necessarily means white people are the oppressors and non-white people are the oppressed. In feminism, it became the power dynamics in patriarchal society necessarily means men are the oppressors and women are the oppressed. And in queer theory, it became the power dynamics in heteronormative society necessarily means straight people are the oppressors and non-straight people are the oppressed. At the same time, we're seeing this distinct convergence of agreement that the problem is the system itself. So the solution calls for solidarity and collective action and spreading consciousness of the nature of this systemic oppression. And then once a critical number of people achieve that consciousness, they can rise up and revolutionize the system and achieve liberation. The third major stage was to tie all these movements together with the introduction of intersectionality while dropping mentions of Karl Marx, but leaving the language of liberation and systemic oppression. So they dropped the language of Karl Marx, but he said earlier that academics were to twist language or even lie or be more covert with their, with their push for Marxism. So they're not going to straight up be like, this is actually a Marxist idea. No, they're not going to do that. They're just going to deliver the ideas of it by getting, but getting rid of that name altogether to look less suspicious of what their ideology or their agenda actually is. But um, yeah, intersectionality sucks, but let's continue. This happened in the late 80s and early 90s, with this being the landmark paper which introduced intersectionality, which is basically a rallying call for people to unite and also recognize each other's various forms of oppression. I don't know if it was a conscious PR strategy. Maybe they thought that they had to drop the name Karl Marx in order to have a chance of popularizing their movement. Or maybe Marx had been adapted and around for so long that his ideas were just so ingrained in the radical left that they weren't even consciously referencing him anymore. I don't know, but either way, this is the time period where the name Karl Marx started disappearing, at least in the published um, academic vernacular. But his ideas of liberation and oppression were still there, and his idea of dividing society up into two parts, oppressed and oppressor, based on identity, yada yada. But in case you're not familiar, this, is, this time period and the work that came out of it is considered the origin for what we think of as wokeness today. So woke people's ideology is directly based on the academic work that was coming out at this time. From what I can tell, Karl Marx as the origin for wokeness is something of an open secret that you're not supposed to say with the occasional slip up. Uh, we actually do have an ideological frame. We uh, are trained Marxists. That was Patricia who says she's a trained Marxist but now owns property. Abolishing oppression but becoming the oppressors. Like I said, it makes no sense, but let's continue. I think the name Karl Marx carries so much stigma in America and the blowback from those kind of name drops tends to be so severe that people have learned not to say his name. But meanwhile, all these writers and activists are talking about systemic oppression and how we need to achieve liberation from it. How do we achieve liberation from it? From triggering an awakening of critical consciousness. What does it mean to be woke? You've awakened to critical consciousness. It's right there in the name. Okay, so what's the point of this? The point is that understanding that wokeness is fundamentally rooted in Marxism sets you up to better understand the movement. It sets you up to understand why they frame problems in the way they do, which we've already talked about. It also sets you up to understand why they frame their solutions in the way they do. So if you go back to their original liberal versus Marxist distinction, if a liberal sees speech, or I guess hears speech that they disagree with, maybe it's hateful speech even, 
they're probably going to want to protect that speech because they think the protection of that speech is necessary for a progressive society. While a woke person, if they hear this speech that they think is hateful or oppressive in some way, they're going to likely want to use the force of their movement to one way or another put a stop to that speech. And they believe that the protection of that speech is contributing to oppression. To give another example, a liberal business owner would probably want to defend their right to hire whoever they think is best for the job, thinking that that leads to the most progress overall. But a woke person might look at that and say, you're trying to defend your right to hire who you want is actually contributing to systemic oppression. And their solution is to use the force of their movement to probably impose some sort of hiring quota on you based on identity, knowing full well they're restricting your freedom, but believing that they're expediting progress. I was literally about to stop it and say just that. It's maddening how, I guess I understand how someone can think that that is the best way to go because they just feel like the, the, the ends justifies the means, right? And who fucking cares if I'm, if I'm taking your freedom away, you're an oppressor. So that's just how they see it. It's like trying to eradicate bullying by becoming the bully. But that's literally what it is. Like they're becoming the bullies themselves, but because they've set themselves up in such a virtuous manner, they don't even see it. They can't even, they haven't even looked at their own reflection and saw that they have morphed into what they hate. Because again, the end is justifying the means. But anyway, let's continue. Those are just a couple examples, but you could use this framework to understand the woke playbook. It's always to abolish something or to use the force of their movement to bend people or society against their will in some kind of direction to end oppression as they see it. By the way, nothing I've said today is supposed to be like a rallying call to go around harassing individual woke people on the basis of them being Don't Marxist. The if there ever was a movement that should be criticized on the basis of the ideas themselves and not the people, this is it. I think to make sense of what's going on, at least in this day and age, we should think of wokeness as a runaway idea in that it's not really under the control of any individual involved. So if you think of media outlets, at least the ones that are caught up in this stuff, it makes sense to why they seem to care so little about how unpopular they've become and how much public trust in them has fallen. And it makes sense to why these woke films that keep coming out and keep crashing and burning keep getting made as if nothing happened. I think wokeness, yeah. like every Marxist organization, positions itself as being the will of the people and yeah, not just not. the will of the people but the will of the people who need to be listened to the most but it's like they say they want to be the will of the people are like please stop go away and they're like no but we're here for you we're the ones that are gonna fight for you and this is why i've said so many times where as a black woman i have felt more harassed by woke white progressive women yelling down at me and telling me how i'm supposed to feel about my blackness it's like they're the bullies, but they're also saying that they're, the, they're our heroes. It's beyond me. But I don't know, it's the guy's brainwashing, indoctrination. But anyway, let's continue. And I think that's a dangerous way to position a movement because if anyone criticizes it, even if you're a high ranking person from within, someone else is likely to point at you and say, hey, you're against the people. So I think that creates this natural pressure against criticism, both internal and external criticism. But we've seen that even like, let's take something like a Dave Chappelle thing when it came to Netflix, right? It was like the, the people said, we want Dave Chappelle. The woke said, we don't care what you want, even though we're there for the people, we're gonna just, dis we want Dave Chappelle gone because he's bad for culture, right? And then a higher ups of Netflix says, look, the people want Dave Chappelle, we're gonna have Dave Chappelle. So then the wokes attack the higher ups of like, well, you're just trying to push that idea because you wanna be an oppressive white man or something like that. <sighs> Let's continue. To where if you're part of the movement, your only really play is to either go with the flow or try to further radicalize the movement. So I don't think there's much point in trying to criticize people to the effect that you're trying to get them to de-radicalize or reform the movement, because I don't really think that's possible. So I think your best bet is to, is to try to get people to leave the movement. I think the best way to do that is to criticize the movement itself. I'm afraid for a lot of people that are watching this, I basically just did a 20 plus minute explanation for how water is wet. <laughs> 
because this is obvious stuff that they've been aware of for a long time. But I think for most people, this stuff is not obvious or they haven't, they're not aware of it or it's controversial or there's lots of disagreement. And that's more the audience I'm trying to reach here. Um, I think even most woke people wouldn't classify themselves as Marxist. But if everything I just said is true, I think it is, then yeah, wokeness is a Marxist movement. And it's crazy how little understood that is because it's a hugely popular movement that has a ton of power. So I hope this was helpful to hear. Either way, thanks for listening till the end. I'm going to close this one out. So catch you next time. I absolutely love that. That was freaking amazing. I I watched like five minutes of it before I reacted to it. I didn't think it was, it got better as it went on. So I hope you guys watched the entire video. Um, I'm, this video is super long. I'm gonna have to really make an effort to edit this shit down. I'll put the uh, probably time steps and stuff like that, but I'm gonna just drop it here. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section below, what I said, what he said. In the comment section below, please like, comment, and subscribe. Hit the bell to get the notifications when I do upload. That really does help with the algorithm, guys. And if you wanna support this channel any further, you can donate. My PayPal me link is in the description description box below because you don't have to you can just like comment and subscribe again hit the bell to get the notifications when i do upload and you guys have an amazing day bye